Fascinating. How about getting FBI agents to talk to you in the book, obviously anonymously as sources, and any advice for crime writers on developing reliable law enforcement sources? From a law enforcement perspective, I mean, most prosecutors, FBI agents, they're very leery about talking to you because there's, there's an ethical question with them. Is you know, how much can they say? They don't want to be quoted. Uh, there, there are very limits to what they can discuss. So my, my strategy often was try to be smart going in, already know what has happened before I even ask the question. And you demonstrate to them that you're on top of the story. You, and, and invariably, and as I'm thinking back to different big mob stories that I had, the information would come from defense attorneys. And then I could go to a prosecutor or a law enforcement person and say, I understand, blah, 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 blah. Well, how do you know that? Well, don't worry about how I know it, but is there some truth to this? And they, they would confirm for background, they would confirm, but they would be only on background. I couldn't use their name, that kind of thing. But it was important to be smart going in. Now, here's a, here's a, here's a prime example. Sure. Of, when John Stanford got indicted in Philadelphia, 1994, there's 26, I think 24 or 26 defendants in that case. It's a major <laughs> racketeering case. Now, this is good news for me that there's 26 defendants because that means there's going to be 26 defense attorneys. If it's a two-person case and I get leaked something, the feds are going to know it came from that. So now you got 26 attorneys. Over the course of this case moving from indictment to trial, which usually takes a year, a year and a half, the government has to turn over all its information to the defense. Right. From discovery. You know, all the wiretaps, all the transcripts, all, everything. Grand jury testimony. Now, as I said, there's 26 defendants and, and lawyers are hired, lawyers are fired. One lawyer who gets fired is pissed off. He calls me up. He says, stop over my office. I want to show you something. <laughs> so I, I go to his office and I walk into the conference room and he's got a stack this, I said, this high. Wow. And he says, do you know what that is? And I look at it. I said, well, it looks like the discovery from the Stanford case. He says, yeah. I said, could I borrow that? He said, sure. I take it off to Staples and I run off copies of everything. Now I bring him back the originals and I've got this treasure trove of information. And I write this big Sunday expose based on affidavits, wiretaps. Nobody knows where I got it because there's 26 defense attorneys have all this now. To this day, there are people who think the feds leaked it to me. It wasn't. It was a lawyer who had been in the case, got fired and was out of the case and still had the documents. And he trusted me. He knew me from other things. I mean, it's, you got to work the beat. And then you know people, and then you don't know. Things fall out of the sky sometimes. It just worked out well. Did you ever see something you were reporting on a real life wind up affecting what was going on in court? There was, there was a case in federal court in Newark. Joey Merlino, the mob boss, was on trial. And one of the key witnesses was supposed to be this guy, Roger Vela, who was a cooperator. And I had gotten a lot of information on Vela. I had gotten what they call his 302s. These are FBI memos. Every time they debrief somebody, they got to make a memo of it. And I had Vela's 302s, and I had been writing about him in, in detail. And I think the, the, the prosecutors in that murder case suspected that the Marino people had been leaking that stuff to me. But the, the bottom line was Vela did not get called as a witness because he had all this baggage and it was exposed. Did that benefit Marino or not? I don't know. Marino beat that case, so maybe it did. But those are the kind of things that... It's almost inside baseball, though. I don't think, you, you know, the, the average reader, it's not even worth writing about. Have you ever had one of these mobsters say Nicky Scarfo give you like a menacing look while you were sitting there in the court gallery reporting on the trial? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't so much Scarfo. But there, there were other guys who just were nasty guys. And, and they would look at me, and you know, because of something I had written or something had been said at, on the witness stand. And, you know, they, they were trying to intimidate me. That, that kind of stuff happens. And you just got to roll with that. that. You know, it's... Um, you try not to respond because you, the, the thing is, I don't want to let any of these guys know they're getting under my skin. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm just doing my job. You don't like it too bad for that. You don't like it. Don't read the paper. You don't like me. I, I can't, I can't help that. This is what I do. Here's who I am. And you know, I'm not going to be anonymous. My name is on everything that I do. I, you get this other thing where people, people, especially with the internet now, where trolls, they post this stuff or they say this stuff. And, and I, I try not to respond because you, you're not going to win that argument anyway. But the only answer I have is whatever I do, my name is on it. I don't try to hide. You're a troll. You're writing stuff about me and, you, you know, some fictitious name. You know, be a man. Stand up. Whatever. So, you know, you, the, you've got to you be confident with 
what you're doing and, and more importantly, why you're doing it. And I think, you know, I, I think I had, I don't want to say I was a crusader, but I, I had a reason for writing about what I was writing about. I saw it as more than just a newspaper story. I saw it as part of where I come from, who I am. I, you know, my grandparents were Sicilian immigrants. They came here. My father was the youngest of seven and the only one in his family who graduated from high school. Wow. He had three children. All three of us have college degrees. His two oldest grandchildren, my daughters, have master's degrees. That's the American immigrant experience. I mean, you know, that's, that's what it is. And, and that's where I come from. And that's, that's what I bring to the table. And, you know, oh. that's, it's, a side, it's an aside. But this is what bothers me about a lot of this anti-immigrant stuff that's going on in America today. Yeah. Immigrants made this country. And immigrants continue to be to make it what it is, and we can't lose sight of that. I agree. My, 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 my grandparents had no skill; they didn't speak English. They couldn't have got into this country under certain restrictions that people want to put on right now. But they, because they came, I'm here. This is so cool. Thank you again for your time. Would you pull the curtain back for viewers on what it's like to clandestinely interview someone who's in the witness protection program while you're writing a book together? When I talked to Caramondi, it was. The government set it up. So yeah, we, we met at a motel in the location where he was. After that, it would be guys would call me up. Guys that were in the program would call me up. And uh, we didn't meet so much. I can't think of too many occasions where we would get face to face, but I would, have a, I would have a line of communication to them. And then I, I could call them and they could call me, et cetera. Here's, here's an example of, of, how can I explain this? When you work a beat for so long, Sometimes your own paper doesn't appreciate what it is that you do. Okay. There was a, a mob hit in, in Philadelphia, uh, Sonny Riccobini. He had been in the witness protection program, and for whatever reason, he left and came back to the area, and he got whacked. That's not smart. Yeah. Now, now I'm doing a story about this, and in my story, I'm able to quote three other guys who were in the witness protection program. Now, that's pretty unique. There are not a lot of reporters wow. in the country that could have done that. No. I was, but it ended up at the bottom of the, the metro section because I had been doing this kind of stuff and it just was, this is what I do. And, and I don't think my editors really appreciated how unique that was. And I, I, I appreciated it, but nobody else did. But it, it's one of those things where, you know, if you work a beat long enough, you, you have all this tremendous kind of access that nobody else has. And you can write stories that nobody else can write. That was one example of it. Witness protection only works if the witness wants it to work. And a lot of these guys can't. I mean, take example, Nick Caramondi. Nick Caramondi was in and out of the program two or three times. This is a guy born and raised in South Philadelphia. And they try to set him up in Alabama. Yeah. So he's not going to fit in Alabama. You know, and, and he's in Alabama telling, and, and part of his backstory is he's from Washington State. But he's got this accent. I mean, those kind of things don't work. A lot of these guys... A lot of these guys, South Philadelphia is the center of the universe, right? Now, there's, there were guys in the, in the Scarf or whatever who went on the run. Some of them went to Brigantine, New Jersey, which is near Atlantic City. Some of them went to the Poconos. And that was like the edges of the universe for these guys. They couldn't <laughs> yeah. go much further. They will fall off. I mean, it's very provincial. So a lot of these guys that go on the program, they, they can't make it. They can't survive. I mean, it's just – and I remember a woman who was put in – witness protection from South Philly and they put her in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She came home. I have to clean it up. But she said to me, there's, she was from Sixth and Catherine and she said, there's no, more people in my neighborhood of Sixth and Catherine than all of Sioux freaking Falls, South freaking Dakota. You know I mean? It, it's, it's not the way it's portrayed. It's very, it's a very difficult life. And a lot of people just psychologically can't do it. 